This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. I would like to thank uh, Lena and UCSB Summer Session for inviting me here. Wow, it's really bright, the lights up here. Um, so today um, we're going to be talking about technology and technology for measuring molecules in real time. But before we start, I would like to actually tell you an important, fairly well-kept secret on where to find interesting and important things in research that could potentially change the world. And not that many people actually know this. So many people think that neat things are interesting. So when you see an image like this, it's neat. It's organized, it's clean. You see shells of similar shapes, decreasing sizes. And similarly, when people look at well-organized fields, equations, well-studied hypotheses, People think that's interesting. I think, I think it, some of these are beautiful, but actually that's not where you find interesting and important things. You find them in very messy places, especially at messy interfaces. So this, I'm about to show you my view of the research world. So what you have <laughs> is lots of big, boring areas. And these are boring because they've already been worked out nicely organized and neatly documented and thoroughly studied. And you also have small boring areas, um, which may not be as big, but what's really interesting in, is that a lot of these areas, people working in these different areas of research, don't talk to each other. And what I found over the last 20 years of research is that interesting things happen at interfaces, where fields meet. It's like the Wild West. And I like food, and I find that to be true in food also. One of the most delicious cuisines I've ever had is Vietnamese French, or kimchi taco. Those things are at interfaces. So, the particular interface that I'll talk about today, which is my own area of research, is the interface between medicine and technology, or biomedical engineering and technology. And so the need to measure um, molecules in complex backgrounds, or the need to isolate rare cells from blood. These sort of biological need to discover have provided motivation to develop novel technology. And as soon as there's a breakthrough in technology, there's usually a breakthrough in biological discovery and medical treatments. And this sort of yin-yang or uh, closed-loop feedback has been going on for a long, long time. And one notable example is this fellow here. His name is Anton van Leeuwenhoek, I think. My Dutch is a little rusty. Um, he's Dutch. Um, he's a scientist and a very successful entrepreneur. He made a fortune. Um, and he actually is often referred to as the father of microbiology. So when I first learned about him, I thought he was a biologist. But actually, he wasn't a biologist in the most sort of usual sense at all. What he did was he invented this instrument. So this is an early version of a microscope. It looks like a medieval torture device of some sort. It's got a pointy end. So this is the mechanical contraption that's actually just a pointer. The magic happens in this little dot here. That is a high-quality, defect-free glass, and he figured out how to make it. So what he did was to take a soda-lime glass rod, put it over a flame, and stretch it out. And when you stretch it out like that, all the impurities in the glass, which prevented high-resolution microscopy before, actually diffuse and segregate out. And then he would go back into the flame and let surface tension ball it up into a perfect sphere. And he figured out how to snap it off and then insert it into this contraption and sell it at a high profit. 
that simple innovation in technology and engineering was not only profitable for him, but it gave the human race entry into a whole new world. We could see microorganisms that we couldn't see before. It is that sort of innovation in engineering that allowed us um, into this world. So this is an optical image of E. coli, obviously not the picture that he took, um, but now we can, from that point on, we could see microorganisms. So that was about 250 years ago. But what's really amazing is that today, us, everybody here, we live in incredibly exciting times. And that's because different major innovations in human achievement are beginning to sort of meet each other. For example, as Lina mentioned, I used to work at Bell Labs designing transistors. So this is Moore's law. It describes the number of transistors as a function of years, and the number of transistors have doubled every 18 months for now four to four and a half decades. And we literally, in your cell phone and large computers, we have over a billion devices that's integrated. It's really a miracle of human achievement. That area of science and technology is beginning to butt up against the molecular understanding of life, disease, death, and maybe how to cheat them. So it's really, really an interesting time to explore this particular interface. So today, what I'll talk about are two things that our lab has been working on over the last past few years. The first part will be on sorting cells. And then in the second half, I'll talk about new ways of measuring them, and they're very interconnected. So let's talk about cell sorting technology. So cell sorting is really important. Uh, in biomedicine. Especially these days, there is this incredible sort of potential and track record of using cells as a therapy. So I'm showing you one of the earliest cell therapies. So this is myoblative autologous stem cell transplant cancer therapy. Right? It's a mouthful of large big words. But what you're really doing is from your own blood, you're isolating blood-borne adult stem cells and purifying them and when you undergo large dose radiation and chemotherapy, your immune system gets heavily damaged, and you can put these stem cells back to reboot your, reboot your immune system. So we can now do things like this, but this technology to sort out rare cells is the key to be able to do things like this. And I know many of you are working in stem cells and other sort of cell-based areas uh, in this crowd. Obviously, cell sorting is critical for biomedical research. So how do you sort cells today? Um, what are the existing technologies? Well, it falls into two camps. First is using magnets. So what you do is you use an antibody to target a particular population of cells of interest. And on the other end, where the, the end that is not doing the recognition, you have a small uh, magnetic nanoparticle. So the target cells become magnetically labeled. You come in with a magnet or magnetic field and simply pour out the rest. This type of sorting is called selection. Um, and usually it's done in a batch mode like so. And the parameter for selection is just one. Is your cell magnetized? Then it's your target. If it's not, you get rid of them. So it's a one parameter selection. And because you could trap billions of cells at once, the throughput is very high. But how pure or how well you have recovered your target cells are pretty much unknown. On the other side of the uh, technology spectrum is an instrument called fluorescently activated, uh, fluorescence activated cell sorters, or FACs. Here, what you're doing is you're literally lining up individual cells in a single row, and you're measuring the optical properties, the fluorescence and the scatter. And so you can measure many different parameters at once, and you're sorting after measurement each one. So you can obtain very high purity and very high recovery, but the throughput is limited. Basically, you're limited to a few thousand cells per second. So you might say, hey, Tom, that's pretty fast, a few thousand cells per second. But if you realize that in a single milliliter of blood, you have a billion cells, and you have five liters of blood, so a thousand cells not that fast. So early on, our lab thought about 
well, these are the existing technologies. Could we create a technology that could sort of take the advantage of both worlds? Could we do multi-parameter selection? Or can we do screening at extremely high throughput? So that's what I'm going to talk about um, for a few minutes. So what matters in cell sorting is really three things. Purity, recovery, and throughput. How pure is your target um, collection? How well have you recovered your target cells? And how many cells can you sort per second? The nice to have bonus things are, can you multiplex multiple parameters? You don't want to put a lot of stress on cells because you know, they do things like they die. <laughs> They're not very useful. Um, and you want to be able to integrate sensing and other capabilities. So this is a pretty tall order. So how do you create a brand new technology that could take advantage of both worlds? When, you, when I'm usually asked questions of this magnitude, I draw inspiration from popular culture. So this is one of my favorite um, movie series, X-Men. Um, I'm going to talk about a couple of characters today, but I'm going to start with this character. I think you guys know her name. Storm, right. And what can Storm do? She can manipulate electric field in the atmosphere and summon a storm at will. Cause lightning, thunder, but all that happens because she can manipulate electric fields. So we're going to talk a little bit about manipulating electric fields. I think many of you um, know that charged bodies move in electric fields. And that phenomenon is called electrophoresis. Um, so here we go, if you have a positively charged particle, it'll follow the electric field and move. But if you have a charge neutral thing, like a cell, a chair, eraser, um, and put it in an electric field like this, it, would it move? The answer is no, because you do have polarization, so you have force, but its balance is equal and opposite. It's pulling on both sides uh, with the same magnitude, so there's no net movement. So many people thought that you can't move charge neutral things with the electric field, but that's not true. If you use a non-uniform electric field and break that symmetry, you can see that there's more electric field per surface area here than here. There's more surface polarization charge density, and you can move charge neutral things with electric field. When I first read about this, I thought it was magic. This phenomenon is called dielectric. So for those of you who are really into sort of rigorous math, um, the closed form solution um, for the translational force of this uh, dielectrophoresis is shown here, where A is the radius of the cells, and this you can see that it's a gradient of the electric field squared. So if you're interested, I could talk to you more in person about this force. But what's interesting is that it depends on the permittivity and conductivity of the particle you're moving. So my colleague at MD Anderson, Peter Gascoigne, actually measured the force on the cells from the electric field for different types here. Um, and so you could either have a positive force or a negative force. You can get attractive force or repulsive force by tuning the frequency. So I thought that was really neat. So phenotype just means characteristic. So dielectrophoretic characteristic of different cells. So when I saw this, I wanted to sort of think about, hey, can we sort out blood-borne stem cells from blood using this force? Wouldn't that be amazing and cool? But it took about an afternoon of thinking, and the answer is, that is just not going to happen. And that's because in blood, you have many different cell types all going through its cell cycle, and it's a gamish, and there's no way to just isolate one cell type from that gamish. Then in an afternoon, a good idea came. I realized that people label things with magnetic particles and fluorophores all the time. I thought to myself, why don't we label things electrically? Label things with metals or polymers that have very different permittivity or conductivity. That way, we can shift this curve of that complex that's labeled way far out of the region where cells are found. It turned out to be a really good idea. So the first experiment we tried is to label different bacterial cells with polymers, simple polystyrene. Polystyrene has very different permittivity and conductivity than cells. So it'll give us the contrast we want. And you can see this is one of the earliest microscope pictures. 
a bunch of bacteria labeled with polystyrene beads. Then what we needed was to invent a device that's really good at sorting them out. And we call these, this device the dielectrophoresis activated cell sorter, or DAX. So this is a corner of our lab um, in the engineering quad. And this cell sorter is a chip. It's a disposable glass chip, size of your typical microscope slide. From, uh, um, so what we do to create this non-uniform electric field that I talked about is we fabricate these electrodes. And these are the channels. To just give you a sense of scale, this part here is about a millimeter. And this thin part here at the exit is about 100 microns, thickness of your hair. And from a device point of view, it's a two input, two output device, fairly simple. And at the input, we're pumping in two different things. On your right is buffer, or just salt water, no cells. And on your right is your sample. Literally, you have billions and billions of cells per milliliter. And this is polystyrene coated with an antibody that's recognizing the surface marker on the target cell. And when that recognition happens, that complex behaves very differently in electric field. It's like a puppet on a string, the string being the electric field, than cells that are not labeled. Then we pump um, our mixture into the uh, input that gets split. So in the middle is the salt water buffer, no cells. And on either side is the sample. Then we turn on the electric field. It's about 10 volts. So your 9 volt battery, it's not that different but you, we're using an AC frequency of about a megahertz, so it's not that high in frequency. And you notice that these electrodes are long and slender. We do that because we want to create a very non-uniform electric field. We don't want a uniform field. So that non-uniform field creates a dielectrophoretic force field, kind of like Star Wars sort of uh, force field, where if you're not labeled, you don't feel that force. But if you're labeled, it's impenetrable there is a repulsion because we tweak the frequency that way. So they get deflected by the force field, which is obviously not visible, it's semi-transparent for your visualization, and get deflected, deflected into your buffer stream in the middle. And it worked remarkably well. And so this is one of my favorite micrographs in my scientific career. What it is, is we're using fluorescently labeled bacteria. So all these bright dots are bacteria. And you see some of these that have bright dots and dark dots. These are fluorescently labeled target bacteria riding on our polystyrene beads. So if you're riding on a bead, you get to ride the escalator and become purified. If you are not labeled, you don't even know that there's an escalator. So that's how we can sort cells very accurately. And what's really beautiful about micro, using microfluidics is that we can now put on many, just like your integrated circuits, many stages together to improve the purity and the recovery. So that's great. So you might say, Tom, that's really good, cool physics, using it in a very different way. But why is this important? What does it mean to me? Well, this is important because ability to sort cells using miniaturized microfluidic technology enables the creation of powerful biosensors that can integrate multiple processes in a single chip. So like your computer, that have different modules for mathematical calculations and graphics, we can start to integrate different functions on a chip. For example, isolating rare cells using dielectrophoresis and other forces, doing DNA amplification such as polymerase chain reaction, and being able to read them out all in a disposable chip that can cost pennies. That's what it allows. <coughs> so one of the earlier work in this type of integration is detecting H1N1 influenza virus directly from patient throat sw uh, swab samples at UCLA. So we created this chip, which is called MyMed chip, that can do separation, and it could purify the virus from the throat swab, and in the middle chamber can perform chemical reactions to copy DNA and RNA of the viruses, and read them out all in a single device. And these set of curves um, need some explanation. But the main takeaway here is that using a technology, integrated technology like this, we can detect down to 10 viruses from a throat swab. Just to give you a little background, if you're infected with H1N1, 
In a single swab, you'd probably have about 10,000 to 100,000 viral particles that are detectable. We can detect down to 10. That's three to four orders of magnitude. That is really powerful, and it's very, very specific because there's no transfer, there's no pipetting, everything is done on a chip. So that is a big advancement for diagnostics, and we're very excited. And the amount of time it takes to do genetic diagnostics like this is about two hours, which, and normally people use culturing, uh, which takes many days, so it's much faster than conventional means. But we thought that, so this is huge, but wouldn't it be amazing if you could actually detect molecules without having to purify and amplify and detect, but just measure it directly in real time? So with the remaining time, I want to tell you about um, this area of real-time biosensor technology uh, that we're really focusing on. So measuring molecules, so real-time molecular detection in vivo, this is a fancy Latin word for in the body, is really, really hard. And today, we can only measure three molecules in real-time in vivo, and they are blood oxygen, glucose, and lactose, and that's it. So blood oxygen is when you go to the hospital or emergency room, they clip something onto your finger, and what it's doing is measuring your oxygen content in your blood directly with a laser. There's no chemistry, and that's all you can measure. You're probably familiar with measuring glucose and lactose, which uses the same chemistry, for diabetes care. It took 40 years and on the order of $40 billion to perfect this technology. And now we have artificial pancreas that's just FDA approved. So this is really hard. And this is it. And this chemistry and methodology is not general, meaning you can't measure other stuff with it. That's it. So we asked the bold question, could we create a technology that doesn't exist, that doesn't use this, a universal real-time biosensor that could measure all other molecules directly in blood or swab or any complex mixture in real time. So that's a very bold question. I wouldn't be telling you this if we didn't do this, so we did. Um, so this is a, um, a quote-unquote universal biosensor, which we call the medic chip. So how did we do this? Well, I'm about to tell you. And of course comes the second character. And it is my favorite character, Mystique. So Mystique is a shape changer, and shape change is a very powerful thing. And Mystique could change into <laughs> any person that you know, and I think we know this person. <laughs> so that's Lena, Lena Kim. Um, and what we're doing is using the same power of shape change um, in a molecule. So we actually create new molecules that is designed to undergo shape change. So normally, it's flopping around in a liquid like this in a surface. But when it binds to the target, which is green here, it's designed to change shape. And when it changes shape, what we do is we put a little reporter here that is reporting the current. So the current is reporting what shape the molecule is in. So in this shape, the current is low, but when it binds to the target, the current is high because this distance, which is on fractions of nanometers, uh, gets closer and the electron transfer goes up and the current goes up, which I'll show you in a bit. And again, this device, the medic chip, is a disposable chip like this. And it has three sort of innovative technologies that's integrated into the chip to make it work. And to describe how it works, I'm going to show you, of course, another movie. We love making movies, by the way. Um, so this is a rat that is really well behaved. It doesn't mind getting stuck with a needle. Um, and what we're trying to do is we're injecting the rat with a chemotherapeutic molecule. If you have cancer, uh, you're probably using this um, chemical, doxorubicin, for treatment. And we're drawing whole blood right out of the rat. And we're trying to measure 
the in vivo level or the in the body level uh, of doxorubicin in a live rat. And so the whole blood goes right into our emetic chips. And blood is a very complex, very gooey, non-Newtonian, it's pretty much half a solid. Um, in a mill, you have a billion red blood cells. So to prevent it from killing our probe, what we do is we create two layers of flow. And this can happen because these devices are miniaturized. Um, and we're, we let the doxorubicin, which is what we're trying to measure, diffuse through our layer of buffer or salt water. And here's our magic molecule, our shape-changing probe. So normally, it's in this shape, but when it binds, boom, it catches the molecule and changes shape. And what we do is we measure the current between our electrochemical reporter and the surface. So if it's not bound, it has a certain characteristic, but when it's bind, the current is much higher, shoots up, and decays at a different rate, and we detect that in real time. So unless that molecule um, binds to the target, it doesn't change shape. It doesn't get fooled by other things in blood. That's the real power. Not only that, we measure the shape change at diff multiple frequencies at once. And much like the technology used in your noise-canceling headphones, we can cancel out the common mode to boost the signal to noise, meaning even if there's noise going on, we can discriminate that from true binding. So that is the technology behind our real-time sensor. So I'm going to show you some um, real data. Um, so at first what we did is we got some whole human blood, and we doped in different concentrations of our target molecule, doxorubicin. And normally when you're receiving treatment for cancer, your concentration is about 2 micromolar here. And what we're showing you here is we can detect much lower levels, much higher levels. It'll go to zero for many, many hours in real time. It's the first time anybody's ever measured uh, molecules in real time besides the three that I mentioned. But this is all in vitro, meaning in the laboratory. Of course, what is really exciting is we can measure this is in, it, directly in the animal, in vivo. And it still gives me goosebumps when I look at this plot. Um, so what we're doing is we're injecting the rat at different concentrations of docs, and we could literally measure every, under one minute, um, the, con the real concentration of that molecule in a rat in real time for many hours. So that is truly amazing, but the real power of our platform is that it's not a one-off. It's not just designed to measure doxorubicin. If we change that shape-changing probe to measure other things, then we can measure other things too. So what we did is we engineered a different molecule for detecting canamycin. It's a different therapeutic. It's an antibiotic, small molecule. It kills bacteria. And we literally just swapped it in to our chip. And now our device can measure the concentration of canamycin in the whole blood right out of rats. So this is really exciting. And as I've mentioned, the real engine behind the whole thing is our shape-changing molecule. That's why I like Mystique the most. It's the most, I think, powerful character. And what these plots are showing is that it's very sensitive. Again, if you're interested in the details, I'll be happy to walk through that after the talk. It's also very specific. It doesn't respond to other molecules. It only measures that target molecule, even if the concentration is a thousand times higher. And our temporal resolution is under a minute. Now we have next-generation devices that can measure it under 10 seconds. So this is really exciting. This is a huge improvement over the sort of um, status quo. But we wondered. You see a pattern here. We're really never satisfied. Um, wouldn't it be amazing if we could not only measure the molecule, but control them in real time? So I'm about to show you something that is very, very recent, very exciting. So what we're doing is using our real-time sensor and feedback circuitry with an infusion pump, and this is what the actual system looks like, to control molecules that we choose in a live rabbit that's not even anesthetized. It's very happy. Uh, we just have to keep it warm. It can do funny things with its ears. Um, and control... Um, any molecule uh, that we choose in any 
waveform. So what, let me explain what this is. So what we're doing is in a computer, so this is time and this is concentration that we want in that rabbit. Um, and so at time equal to t 10 minutes, we want a concentration to be 10 micromolar for this long, and at about 50 minutes, come down to zero. And our feedback circuitry, in, the, in concert with a real-time sensor and the infusion pump, can make that happen. Or we could have other waveforms of our choice. And since our technology doesn't really care whether it's a rabbit or a rat or a human being, it's cross-species. So here's exact same um, system, closed-loop control, um, done in rats. So this ability to actually control molecules in a live animal, and soon to be humans, opens up incredible opportunities to use therapeutic drugs that couldn't be used because of narrow toxic to therapeutic windows. And it gives us the tantalizing possibility of actually controlling biological processes directly inside a living animal. So we're really, really excited about that. So my clock is showing that our time's running out. I would like to acknowledge our very, very talented um, young researchers in the lab. Um, and I would like to also thank our collaborators that made this work possible. Uh, Kevin Plaxcore and Todd Kippen's lab um, at UCSB and Jamie Thompson's lab at the Morgridge Institute and UCSB and our funding agency. So as an epilogue, I hope I've convinced you that we today live in an incredibly exciting time. And I wasn't kidding when we are really beginning to understand and manipulate the molecular basis of life, death, and disease. I think it's really here. Um, so, your mission, should you choose to accept it, <laughs> is, I know uh, many of you here are doing research on campus, which I think is terrific, is to find your interesting interface. Don't go here because it's nice and clean and all worked out. Don't, this is even worse, this is a smaller boring area. Go <laughs> and find the interfaces that, uh, because that's where interesting things are. And I'd be happy to take some questions. Um, so obviously like the, all that stuff is really, really cool, um, but I was wondering like is it still being developed or when's it going to move out of the lab? Like what's the time scale for actually using it? Because there's obviously a lot of applications that would help so much in different medicines. Yeah, good question. So the question is, you know, there's all these important things happening in research. How long does it take to, imp to be implemented? Uh, in the clinic, and typically for diagnostic devices like this, where you're not actually putting things in, um, it takes on the order of about five years. That's the FDA approval period is about five years. For therapeutic molecules, if you want to create a new therapy, that's longer, it's about 10 years. So um, there's been sort of spin-off companies from our lab who are trying to do that, um, actually done by students who did this work. Another question too. Uh -huh. um, so, have you developed um, all the different or like a lot of different molecules to for the shape shifting uh, um, great molecule? Question. Like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the question is, you know, as you as I mentioned, the real engine that makes a real time sensor work is that shape changing aptamer, um, and actually about seventy percent of our lab works on creating these aptamers and about 30% of the lab works on using the aptamers in different ways. Uh, and I don't know, maybe next year I'll talk about how to create these aptamers, but it's an entire different field in itself, a field called directed evolution. Thank you. Sure. Hello. Hello. Uh, I was just wondering how exactly you go about real time being able to give subjects 
a substance and then measure it? Because you mentioned that you can detect it, but how do you control how it's going into the body? Ah, great question. I apologize, I didn't spend that much time in explaining the control system, but what we're doing, this is for the control part, right? Yeah. So we have a programmable infusion pump that gets its signal from the feedback controller. So it's a, basically it's a syringe that we can program from the computer signal. Okay, so it's receiving how much and then knows whether it's Yeah, the rate of more. injection from the feedback control algorithm. Okay, awesome, thank Great. you. Sure. Hi. Uh, my question was just, uh, so what is the like probe that you guys are using? Is it like a protein? Is it like a biomolecule or is it like an engineered Sure, molecule? this shape changing yeah. molecule. So these are actually a class of molecules called aptamers. Aptamer comes from the Latin word aptus, to fit into things like lock and key. Actually, they're made completely of nucleic acids. They're not amino acids like proteins. And um, we use them because the key thing here is to be able to fold reversibly. So when you bind, you fold, but when it unbinds, you need to go back. And nucleic acids are really good at reversible folding. That's why we use them. Great and question. Uh, I think you mm -hmm. kind of addressed this a little bit, mm -hmm. but um, could you kind of go into how these like molecules are engineered? Can you just like kind of explain? Oh, so I use the word engineered, but actually they're evolved in the laboratory. So um, this field of directed evolution that I've just mentioned is instead of trying to engineer a molecule that does this, which is impossible, um, we start with a very, very huge library, like 10 to the 14 in terms of diversity. And evolution just needs three things. It needs mutation, selection, and amplification of the strain with a winning characteristic. And we can do that in the laboratory. In this case, the characteristic of the winning uh, sort of strain is being able to fold when the target binds. So we go through many rounds of evolution to whittle down from a very large library uh, a few molecules that can do this, then we start to tinker. And that whole area is called directed evolution. Thank you. Uh -huh. When you use the chip uh, mm -hmm. to detect the disease in vivo, um, mm -hmm. do you how much blood do you need, or do you need a continuous flow? Oh, great question. So we're actually, so in this experiment, in this chip, oops, <laughs> you guys like that, huh? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we, because we're using a microfluidic chip, um, we're drawing less than half a milliliter per hour. Um, so about 400 microliters, about 10 drops of blood per hour. Very small amount. Uh, sorry, follow up. Mm -hmm. um, do you use like that amount of blood and like divide by how many um, aptamers have gone down? Uh, just to see no, this aptamer folding is yeah. a pure um, function mm -hmm. of the concentration of the target molecule in the blood. Okay. Yeah. So you use that directly. Absolutely. Okay. Microfluid cell sorting and then the fluorescence activated cell sorting. Mm -hmm. I said that only the fluorescence is has a purity high and the other one is unknown. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So whoa. So I think you're referring to this slide. Could you repeat the question? Um why is it that you guys only show the purity for fluorescence but not the magnetic cell? Ah, gotcha. So we know the purity because this sort of scheme is based on measurement. We could literally count the, well, we can literally measure the fluorescence and scatter from each cell, and we make a decision based on that. So, um, so it's a measurement and then action upon it. So that's why we know the purity and recovery, but because we have to measure each one, it's slow. But on this side, all you're doing is you're using the accuracy of your antibody to label, once it's labeled, it gets magnetically pulled out. So you don't, it's not a, it, there's no measurement. So we could actually, once we sort it using magnetics, we can go back here and count. But by itself, we actually have no idea what the purity or the recovery is. So will there be something else that you can use to 
So actually, in a therapy where you need to um, sort a lot of cells from a huge amount of you know, volume, like the um, transplant therapy, you use both. So you use the magnetic separation or selection to enrich your target cells, kind of you know, with 50 to 90% accuracy, and then use facts to measure each one. So they're used usually in tandem. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh. Hi. Um, my question is about um, the ability to actually control the molecules you actually inject in um, a subject. Mm. Um, my question is that what happens after a long period of time? What, are, they still, are you guys still able to control the, the, the molecules that you inserted in the subject after a while? Or what happens? Oh, I see. It? So I, if I rephrase your question, um, how long does these type of therapeutic molecules last in the body? Yeah. yeah. Um, you can see directly from data um, that, for example, so the first molecule that I talked about, doxorubicin, it is the most widely used chemotherapeutic drug. And you could literally see that it doesn't last very long. This is the actual concentration. So you could see it. Within an hour, you lose like 80 to 90%, and it gets circulated, and you get, it gets distributed to your body, hopefully concentrating at your tumor. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. Hi. Hi. So regarding um, detecting diseases in real time, mm -hmm. how long does it take to um, find the correct shape-changing aptamer, especially for new viral and bacterial strains and epidemics yeah. and stuff? great question. Um, so the question is, if you have a new target, a new um, protein, bacterial protein, or viral protein, how long does it take to create a new shape-changing aptamer? It really depends on the target itself. Some targets are really recalcitrant. It's really difficult to create a binder to it. Some targets are easy. Um, but in general, if I had to um, sort of answer, if somebody gives me a new um, antigen, it's a protein, how long would it take? I would say a good three to six months of engineering. Thank yeah. you. Yep. Hi, I was Hi. wondering um, if you guys, in do you guys have or can make um, an application to instead of um, controlling and measuring molecules to like go further to controlling the actual body or a human body? Yes. Um, yeah, in a way, the artificial pancreas project is to control the physiological state, right? You are measuring the glucose, and so that's what pancreas does. And then you're injecting right amount of insulin to keep homeostasis. So you are controlling the bodily function. Right now, we're only controlling what we put in. But as you correctly point out, our next stage is you put in a therapeutic molecule now we're trying to read the body's response to it and feedback on that. That's an ongoing, high-profile project. And that way, you're, you can replace a damaged organ or a physiological process that has gone awry. Yep. Okay, so let's give a big, warm round of applause to Dr. Tom Sell. Thank you.